Welcome to The Commute, a Bible study podcast designed to turn your commute into an opportunity to grow in your faith. Whether you're sure of what you believe or you're not sure what to believe, this podcast is designed to help you better understand who Jesus is, what the Bible's all about, and how that applies to your life today. I'm your host, Pastor Matt, and I'm excited to dive into this week's episode of The Commute. Well, hey, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Commute. It is a joy to uh, talk about God's Word with you this week, and I'm uh, pretty pumped that this is uh, our inaugural episode together, Kenzie. Uh, thanks for uh, for joining me. Yeah, thanks. Or really, I should say, thanks for letting me join you. You've kind of turned into the the regular host these I, days. I guess so. Yeah, that's that's a real thing. And <laughs> as you can see, we are um, donning some of the newest um, Bethlehem wear in our uh, our Call to Serve shirts. So I guess quick plug for some of the service opportunities we have coming up this summer, especially BBS at the end of this month, beginning of next. Yeah, first week in August. If, if you're looking for a very comfortable t-shirt, and uh, something that, that looks pretty nice, come come and serve, and we will hook you up. That's true. Uh, so this week, we are going to talk about 2 Corinthians. And um, I guess I'll just go ahead and, and start, yeah. share a few things. So this is the second of two letters we have from Paul to the Christians in Corinth. And fun fact... We know of four different letters that Paul mentions as he's talking to the Corinthians. There is a letter that comes before what we know as second or as First Corinthians, excuse me, and there is another letter that actually comes in between First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. Sadly, we have neither of those letters, but we do have these two, and I think in them we find um, a lot of really really fascinating stuff and a lot of stuff that is edifying for our walk of faith uh, today. So I guess I'll, I'll ramble on for just a no, <laughs> one more minute of background stuff and then we can get into some of the, the more fun stuff. So kind of the, the sequence of events here is Paul is in Corinth as a part of his missionary journey, goes away, writes the letter we have is 1 Corinthians to address a myriad of issues going on in the Corinthian church, some of them really quite messy, like a man's got his father's wife. Um, there are lawsuits. <laughs> there are questions about what to do in worship, and Paul is trying to address all of these. Well, after this letter, apparently there is a visit made by Paul to Corinth again, and Paul calls it a painful visit. This is, and we know this from 2 Corinthians now, 2 Corinthians 2, um, beginning of the chapter there. Uh, Paul says, For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me, made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love I have for you. So Paul's continuing this relationship with a kind of turbulent church, and this relationship is a bit turbulent. And uh, as you read through chapter 2, you find that there are some things that, um, that did get ironed out, but there are still some challenges uh, in that church, and there are some goals that Paul himself is trying to accomplish in and through the Christians in Corinth. So we now have 2 Corinthians. <laughs> That's my whirlwind background tour. Kenzie, where where do you want to take us next? Well, I'm grateful that you shared that history because all I knew was second letter to the Corinthians. Apparently there's four. So there are four. Appreciate that. Um yeah, I don't have a lot of context of the turbulence of the church, but I do have a couple of verses that I highlighted or underlined that I thought were really cool. Let's do it. And so, um, First one I had was in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, that says, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And the verses above that talk about um, 
man. <laughs> About God's yes and God's no and how he sent Jesus to make his yes through him. And I just thought that was a really great way to put it. I feel like in life we have a lot of situations where we ask for a yes or a no. And usually when it's a yes, we can point it back to Jesus in some way. So I thought that was really cool. I think that's huge. Um, what comes to, to my mind, of course, my, my mind jumps to like parenting analogies. <laughs> and my, my kids ask me for things all the time. And sadly, uh, many times I say no. And I can see the disappointment in their faces and I can remember the disappointment. And really, I still feel the disappointment when I'm told no. And uh, to think of a, of a God who is yes. In Jesus, it, it is yes. I think, um, I just think that's that's such a gift and that's um, at least kind of liberating and, um, yeah, l- liberating and just really delightful and happy. I, th- th- <laughs> does that make any sense? No, I... I'm tracking. I also think like, I think of like a worship song. It's probably called Yes and Amen. But I think that like when we see, when we see God's yes, we can usually point it back to, like it says here, like his promises. Like we know that God is true and faithful and patient. And when we find a yes, that like everything kind of comes together and you can usually see one of the aspects of God in in the, the right yes, I guess. Because there's mm-hmm. a worldly yes and there's a godly yes, and I think that those are very different things. It, indeed they are. <laughs> very, very often uh, the divine yes uh, maybe feels like a, like a no because it's very often, I think, a wait. And um, yeah, I think that's a, an awesome insight. Um, you said you had another one un- underlined? Yeah, I mean, I went through this. I went through it in a couple different translations. Um, but way, it, way to go, by the way. <laughs> quick quick encouragement. Uh, reading and rereading the Bible is a tremendously helpful practice. So be, be like Kenzie and do that. And if you can do it in multiple translations, different things will pop out to you. So That's true. Yeah. So in the ESV, and I mean, it says essentially the same thing in all of them, but um, chapter 2, verse 15, I just thought that this was really great imagery and it says for we are the aroma of christ to god among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing and this might be a stretch but um the staff is doing a 90 day bible reading plan together in addition to working on some of the commute things as well and um we're in leviticus right now which is a very uplifting very uplifting book that's a joke, but there's a lot of rules um, and a lot of things about sacrifices and things like that. And so when I um, was reading through that, a lot of it is when they give a sacrifice of an an- of an animal, it gives a pleasing aroma to God. And so um, this verse about we are the aroma of Christ to God, it, it really like that's the gospel message being preached in a really poignant way if you understand the role of Christ as a sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice that took away the sacrificial animal system and like gave us salvation and renewal through through him. And so I just thought that, that was really, that was a lot, but. No, I, I think that is a <laughs> tremendous connection. Um, kind of quick, quick, quick aside, what is your favorite aroma of all time? Well, I have like a lot of fake ones. So um, someone actually asked me that yesterday on, I was I did like an Instagram thing. I was like, ask me any question you want. And they're like, what's your favorite smell? And as a joke, a complete joke, I said warm tuna, which is not at all my favorite smell. Thank the Lord. <laughs> yeah, if you smell that anywhere around me, that is not a good sign. But I don't really, I think like a fresh pine tree, like cutting down okay. a fresh pine tree is a pleasing aroma. That's good. You all are probably going to think I'm so strange when I tell you what mine is. You know what it is? Gasoline. What? Yes. 
Ga- gasoline what? is like my all time favorite aroma. If someone were going, to, if if someone like, were going to like offer, yeah, some like the pleasing aroma I to you is gasoline. Wonder if they make a candle that's gasoline scented. If, if, if they do, I have not found it, but I'm sure on the interwebs it, yeah. it exists. Uh, yeah. Is, so fun, fun facts that's about uh, interesting information Ken, about Ken, you, Kenzie and Casey, this week. Um, <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I think um, talking about ourselves as the kind of sacrifice to to God, and even the, I guess the the aroma not not just to God but to to the world, right? To continue uh, that that verse among those who are uh, are among those who are being saved and those who are perishing to one a fragrance from life to life, and to the other or from death to death and to the other fragrance from life to life, uh, to consider ourselves as um, something that sort of like wafts into the rest of the world <laughs> and uh, people have a sensory experience of what a follower of Jesus is like through an encounter with us. Um, I think that's a tremendous in- encouragement for us as we go into the places we go, the things we're, we're called to do. Um, I forget who it was, but there was, um, there was someone who was talking about a, another follower of Jesus and, and they just said, you stink like Jesus. And uh, <laughs> that, that line has always stuck with me. And uh, I think we do well, I guess, to stink like Jesus for whatever that's worth. All right, let's, let's march ahead here. There are a lot of fun things in this letter. Um, a place that I go to frequently, especially, um, when I see people in, um, in the midst of sickness or the midst of, um, challenges aging, uh, is second Corinthians four, um, starting at verse 16. Uh, it says, so we do not lose heart though. Our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And Paul goes on in chapter 5 to talk about our our earthly tent being destroyed, but we have a a heavenly dwelling. And I think that's uh, just been uh, a really helpful passage uh, walking through uh, some of the, the physical challenges of life with, um, with many people and um, even for folks like us who are maybe young and not experiencing <laughs> the, the kind of uh, wasting away of the outer self yet, um, I think it's helpful to have, a, uh, have my perspective sort of uh, expanded or zoomed out to see that there is more than what we are experiencing right now. And um, whatever this momentary affliction might be for us, it is just momentary and it is um, nowhere near what will be someday. So that's, that's something else that sticks out to me. No, that's, that's good. I feel like I sometimes struggle with like the idea of object permanence, like, you know what I mean? Like you... Uh, let's let's unpack that. All right, o- all right. Object permanence, where, well, you where know, are we going? Like, children, for example, like, when they're young and you do, like, hide and seek, like, there's research that says that, like, they truly don't know where you went when yeah. you're hiding behind your hands. And, like, I feel like there's so many things that, like, I forget about when they're not right in front of me. And, uh, like... That is why, like, being in ministry is such a gift to me because, like, I get to spend most of my day digging into the Bible and being reminded of all these promises. And it's really easy when it's not the thing that you're thinking about all the time to to remember that, like, God's kingdom is more than just this one moment or this one place or anything like that. Like, it's eternal. It's all around. It's much more than our day to day. Like it's not just, I'm not the center of God's kingdom and you're not either. Sorry. Thank you for that. I (laughs) I need that big time. Yeah. I just, I had a conversation with Irene the other week and I was 
we actually researched like when you develop object permanence and it's like I want to say like a year year and a half is when like you fully kind of get this idea that like things still exist even when you're not looking at them Mm -hmm. but I think we all have a lack of object permanence when it comes to things that we don't understand or we don't completely see and God only reveals the pieces that we need to get through. <laughs> yeah. So this is like a, a whole new way of thinking for me. I've never thought about <laughs> this in this way that, yeah, I think what you're talking about is similar to my own experience that when thing, when I guess like spiritual things are not in front of me, I have a hard time remembering them, using them, leaning into them. I'm not quite sure what, what the right, languages am, am i sort of tracking yeah. with what with what you're talking about yeah and so i i resonate 100 percent with the experience of like it is being in god's word that has forced me to be reminded of of these things and um i think more and more i'm, I'm experiencing the scriptures as as like spiritual food and nourishment like and there, and there are a lot of things I, I don't remember about the things that nourish me, right? Like, I couldn't tell you what I ate for lunch yesterday, even. But, like, sure. I know I'm still alive because of it, you know? <laughs> um, and, I, and I think that's even how my time in the Bible goes. Like, I might not be like, yeah, we've been doing this Bible reading plan. And I might not be able to tell you what I ran into <laughs> a week ago. But I know I'm spiritually a, alive because of it. Um, yeah. Is that... No, that's... I. Th- this is sort of like turning into Casey Ramble. Uh, no, but, uh, I'm here for it. We, we never know where the commute's actually going to go. It's the inaugural episode. Like, I want to hear it. This is good. All right. Where where should we go next? Oh, man. I actually have that piece that you just spoke of, of 416. How about that? Through 18 as part of my, my underline. Um, but we can... We haven't gotten into chapter three yet, so Let, let's backpedal. Go yeah. go to three. Yeah, so uh, I just feel like this is a really great like proclamation of our role in the kingdom of God and what Christ has done for us. It's um, chapter three, verse four through six. It looks like, and it says, "Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God." Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Mm. I just think that Paul really has a way of just like sharing the gospel in and making it really tangible of like, Yes, Christ died for us for this renewal and this forgiveness, but also, like, because of that, there's a realization that in and of ourselves we're not sufficient, but Christ paid it all so that we could be. And because of that, we're sent. And I just think that's the crux of it all. Yeah, I mean, it's a (laughs) really compact and efficient way of saying the entirety of God's work and the entirety of his continued work through his people whom he has made sufficient in Jesus. Um, Yeah. And I, I love uh, the kind of back back and forth of like confidence and doubt that I, I perceive in Paul throughout second Corinthians. Like um, I think there are, there are moments where Paul is obviously having kind of a, a, a dark moment of the soul and then other moments where He's sort of coming out of that and saying, like, such is our confidence uh, that we have through Christ toward God. And um, I think that kind of pendulum swing back and forth is um, the kind of experience many followers of, of Jesus have. And I I derive a lot of encouragement out of verses like these, too. Um It is a good confidence boost for me as well. It's good. All right. We've got, I think, seven, eight more chapters that we could talk about. Um, I'm going to forge ahead, if that's all right, um, all the way to chapters eight and nine. 
for any of you who may have been tuning into some of our Roman sermon series a couple weeks ago, we talked a little bit about this collection that Paul was taking for the saints in Jerusalem. And <laughs> in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is the lengthiest treatment of this collection. And I think it's just a really cool project that Paul's embarking on here uh, to basically fund monetary relief for the church in Jerusalem. And uh, the funding is coming from Christians all over the Gentile world. And uh, for Paul as minister of the, the Gentiles and as someone who really kind of came out of the, out of the Jewish world, out of the epicenter of, uh, well, yeah, out, out of Jerusalem, this is just a really cool bringing together of Christians from all over the, the world at, at this time. And um, I guess the, the verses that I would um, point out are in chapter 9. Um, Starting at verse 6, Paul says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And I think there's there's a nice tie-in to the, the sufficiency and uh, then the subsequent generosity. And it's, it's because God has made us sufficient in Jesus and has taken care of our greatest need through his own generosity that now we, uh, with cheer, with true joy, can be generous with ourselves, the stuff we have under our stewardship, um, and live in a pretty unique way. So that's... That was something that jumped out at me, too. There was just a very loud <laughs> thunderclap. Oh, my goodness. And it, it is still going. Uh, so it is... Uh, par pardon that interruption. If that was <laughs> Commercial all. Break. All. Commercial Sorry. break. Sorry. Yes. All right, Kenzie, what do you want to talk about next? No, I think that was a really good piece in verse 9. I don't think I made it quite that far, but... Um, I worked um, as the president of a, a student-led ministry at Concordia called 908, which is based on 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. So that really? was... Really? Yeah. So I just kind of had a moment there of... We would say this every single um, Wednesday, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all things at all times, you will abound in every good work. <laughs> so that that was like your, your mantra. Yeah. That was what we kind of spun around every single week. So that's, that's cool. Uh -oh. It's cool to see how that, that verse lives today. Yeah. And also kind of with that, like being a cheerful giver, I think it's been really helpful to me, um, being the, the post-college student I am with, I mean, a handful of bills, but also a handful of like, things that I don't have a strong tie to like I'm just I just made it into the real world you know but it's been really helpful to me to be a cheerful giver is having like a like instead of a scarcity mindset having like a surplus mindset of like God has given me all of these things like I walk into my apartment and I'm like I have a lot of chairs I hope that like people will come in so I can use all of these chairs like instead of being like these are my chairs this is my favorite chair that's a really weird way to look at it, but I think, like, having a surplus mindset of, like, being able to take what we have or what we've been given and use that to love others and to, in this case, I mean, build up the church in Jerusalem, but in our case, we are invited to do similar things. Yeah, that's huge. Take that nugget away. Surplus <laughs> mindset. That is, that is gold right there. All right, uh, there's one more spot that I think is worth talking about before we run out of time, and that is chapter 12. Paul uh, kind of bears his soul here and talks about his own weaknesses and struggles, especially like in the context of there are kind of competing super apostles who are exercising some influence over the, the Christians in Corinth, and Paul is working to... Um, I guess reestablish or solidify his own calling as an apostle to these to these people, 
and um, basically says, I'm, I'm not in this for self-promotion or um, anything other than the gospel of Jesus. And um, I think he, he shows that he's not selling himself or trying to peddle God's word, but la- lays himself bare in full vulnerability so that the power of Jesus might be um, even more clearly perceived by, by the readers. So I, I'm going to go ahead and read some sec- some section of verse 12 here. And um, let's see here. We'll see what we, what we think. So verse 6 in chapter 12. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So, to keep me from becoming conceited because of, a, of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. They're sufficient again. Look at that. Um, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore... I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Whoa. Uh, There is a a lot going on there. Um, It is counterintuitive. I think we we live in a in a time that prizes strength, that prizes um, victory, that prizes achievement and success, and um, despises weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. Um, but the call for for a follower of Jesus for Paul, and I think for us, is to have contentment even in our weaknesses. Um, This is a challenge for me. It's a real challenge. Um, But there again, I I think it's the the words of the Lord that are what I need to hear. My grace is sufficient for you. It's his sufficiency, not ours. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> he ma- he makes us sufficient and I just I'm grateful for that as someone who is new to ministry and <laughs> sorry <laughs> there's quite there, the storm there goes, outside there goes the thunder again um yeah I think that what you said about the weakness piece like we I think we often skip to what's good and not what's hard like revolving around ourselves like it's like oh that was a really hard day but it's okay I'm okay you know Mm -hmm. what I mean and uh, I think this is a much bigger thought than just from chapter 12 of second Corinthians but I think like God invites us to uh, in this part of course be be weak but to come to him with that and to feel our emotions and to be be truthful with what we're good at, what we're not good at, because back to uh, the beginning of the book, like our sufficiency is through Christ and not through uh, anything that we can muster up, which isn't much on a on a good week. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's so true, and um, I think this is where I've also found a lot of. Um, a lot of grace from the body of Christ to be among a group of people who um, can boast in weaknesses and be real about um, things like sin and and brokenness and confess those things not not just to to God like when we worship but even confess them to one another um, and let the grace of God be sufficient not just for me but let it let it be sufficient for um, those walking this walk with me too. Um, for sure. Yeah, there are a lot of a lot of different dimensions to this, and we could probably talk about it for a long time.
I don't know. There, there's more thunder. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm almost wondering if we're if we're being uh, called upon to, yeah. to stop here. Um, God might have said that's enough, you guys. But yeah. So, uh, are there any any other thoughts that we didn't get to that you want to make sure the folks viewing, listening, here? I think we did a, a pretty all right job at summing it up. I guess we'll have to ask God who's cracking some thunder outside I, I, but I know. uh well i'm feeling good about where we've left things this has been uh a really fun time for the uh inaugural episode uh this has been good thanks for joining us everyone uh we hope uh you have a, a great week and uh that your reading of god's word brings you uh lots of encouragement and new insight and um if you have any questions or want to talk about these things like we we love to talk about these things, so For please sure. reach out to us. You can do that through our website, through our, our mobile app. Uh, you can stop us if you see us in person, if you're, uh, if you're local. Love to talk about these things. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, so th thanks, Kenzie, and thanks uh, to yeah. all of you for joining us on The Commute. We will see you next week. See you next week. Thanks for checking out this episode of The Commute. For more information on The Commute, or to join the Commute Bible Reading Plan, simply download the Bethlehem Church Live mobile app or go to Bethlehem Church Live slash the commute.